We're uh, really happy to kick off the session uh, for PSFK and um, really excited about the possibility to discuss with this diverse panel um, the different ways retail and experiential is kind of evolving and changing. Um, what we'll do is give a little brief introduction of who we all are, and then we'll jump right into some Q&A. Um, and then later in the presentation, we're going to be doing a um, kind of a different approach with, a, with our our panelists set set up as teams. So uh, my name is Mick McConnell. Um, I am the founder of Ann McConnell, which is a creative strategy company um, doing kind of retail and um, workplace uh, consultation. My cohort here, Ryan McLaughlin. Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan McLaughlin, the CEO and founder of MCL Digital, an innovation consultancy and global lab focused on retail, mobility, tech, and new work. I've worked with retailers big and small on their digital and physical presences from Walmart to Converse. And uh, with Mick, really excited to, to be kicking off a Future of Retail Festival today. Alexander, do you, can you say a little bit about yourself? Sure, um, Alexander Martin from Deutsche T uh, Telekom, uh, T-Mobile's mother company. After the acquisition of Sprint, um, we have about the same size as the city of Honolulu does have citizens. Um, we sell products that usually needs explanation um, as connectivity is something that is not haptic and even though we do use online channels a lot, we also have and probably will uh, use a long time of brick and mortar places. Great. Irene? Hi, I'm Irene Huang and I spend my days uh, supporting our next generation of designers as both thinkers and innovators and uh, with a particular focus on how architecture can serve social justice issues like climate change or spatial inequality through thinking about ways that we can all make uh, better everyday decisions about the built environment. So super excited to be here, guys. Thanks, Irene. John. Uh, hi, I'm John Levy. I'm a human behavioral scientist. I study influence and decision-making uh, and essentially, uh, companies contact me when they want to build deep and meaningful relationships with their most important customers or their employees. So when relationships really matter. And I spend a lot of my time besides consulting with company, convincing people to cook me dinner uh, because 12 years ago, I started a secret dining experience where 12 people at a time cook dinner, but they can't talk about work or give their last name. And when they sit down to eat, they guess what everybody does. And they find out that it's uh, Olympic medalists, editors in chiefs, occasionally members of royalty, uh, Nobel laureates, and so on. So I've hosted about 2,000 people across 227 dinners. I think we should just have the entire panel discussion talk about those dinners. I think they're amazing. <laughs> uh, Katie. Hi, that's a really hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm Katie Hunt. I'm the co-founder of Showfields, which is an experiential department store which showcases the most interesting artists, brands, and experiences. We have two locations, one in New York City, which we just reopened again last Friday after 103 days. And uh, we are launching our second location in Miami later on this year. Great. Uh, Zach, did you get a, did you join? Yeah. I am joined in, in here. Sorry, I was. Uh, no, it's great. Hey, Zach. For some reason, not unmuted when you uh, when you uh, asked me to to start. So, uh, my name is Zach Normandin. I'm the founder and CEO of Iris Nova. We're a uh, direct consumer beverage company um, enabled by technology. So we started uh, with a brand called Dirty Lemon and sell our products um, or sold our products with Dirty Lemon through text message, and then we've since expanded to a portfolio of brands selling products now, not only in direct consumer, but through Walmart and other channels. So, um, but we're really re reimagining uh, a beverage distribution with a, with a, you know, a, a slant on technology and data, really driving all of our decision making. That's great. Well, I'm sure we will we will delve into that greatly in a couple of the questions we have, especially one of the group questions. Uh, Ryan, <laughs> do you want to kick off um, first question for this group of Great panelists. Yeah, I just want to say again, awesome to have you guys here today. Um, we have such a wide range as probably everybody could just hear of expertise areas and backgrounds. I think it's great that it's obviously a diverse group from many different kind of thought areas uh, that are going to help us think through how retail can thrive in the future. 
Um, so jumping right into it, um, this is maybe a little bit more directed at Katie and, and at Zach, but obviously everyone feel free to, to dive in. Um, you know, as one of the things that Mick and I were thinking about as we were going into this panel is that, you know, culture keeps inventing ways that we shop, uh, whether it's malls or strip malls, e-commerce to TikTok. Um, but the headlines that you see, at least recently again, are that retail is dead or dying. Um, those have obviously resurfaced and forced uh, due to COVID-19. Um, but the long-term sales statistics really speak against this. Uh, we just think that retail is really just evolving. So really curious to know, where do you see this evolution going in experiential and omni-channel and e-commerce across the board? Uh, so for us at the Showfield side of things, we believe that the future of retail is e-commerce, which is consumer commerce. In the same way that every direct-to-consumer company that has been successful has reimagined itself around the pain point for the consumer, from Uber being like, you don't want to stand out in the rain and try and find a cab, and you reimagine that experience the way that the customer wants to see it. Uh, we believe that retail, again, is not dead, it's just evolving, but it's evolving to be uh, reimagined by the consumer, and the consumer's needs uh, are so much greater than they've ever been historically in terms of their expectations on that experience. Um, so for us, it's about connectivity and community and content, um, but it's about really reimagining the store through them instead of through the retailer and through the business. Uh, if I could jump in, I love uh, what Katie's saying because uh, from a behavioral standpoint, um, Ryan, can I ask you a question? Uh, have you ever been to a restaurant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, could you cook at home? Could you yes. just have Instacart or something deliver food to your house? But you still go out which means that there's a fundamentally important factor to one, leaving your house and two, having, because, you know, if it's Chipotle or it's John George, it's a retail experience for food. So there is something about going outside, probably with people that you care about and having an experience and paying for something. That probably won't disappear because fundamentally we need human contact. And what we see, and if you look at the research, is that between 1985, I think, and 2004, the average American went from having two friends to, th uh, sorry, from three friends to two friends, meaning we've gotten lonelier. And what I think we're going to see is kind of this return to wanting to connect with each other in meaningful and deep ways. And that means that retail will need to evolve in some way to allow for the human connection aspect. Um, but we're still going to go out to restaurants. And even when people are at the risk of getting sick with COVID, they're still going out to connect with one another. So I don't think that's disappearing anytime soon. Can I tag along on that? Um, it, my, my question would be then to John, um, I'm completely with you that we uh, social animals will need the human contact. However, is the human willing to pay for that? If you are shopping with Amazon, you get the same uh, the same product from the shelf at Amazon than you get at the 7-Eleven um, or whatever. Um, for the restaurant, this is not the same thing. You cannot order this uh, to your home. It's a different experience. So, are, are we as humans willing to pay for the for, for the brick and mortar that has to be there? And this is a question that I think is really, really driving a lot of us. And whether or not we are willing to invest in that. Not only are we willing to pay for it, I think what we're finding is that it actually supercharges the consumer who's walking in. I mean, all data points to the fact that return rates go down, that person becomes much more brand loyal. I think there is this inherent desire to hear stories and to hear about brands and discover new things. I think Amazon as a tool is incredibly efficient, right? It's incredibly affordable, uh, but it's not great when you're looking for something new and you're looking to be inspired. The discovery is actually kind of broken within uh, Amazon. You go in very intent-based um, and with all of these new brands coming up in the world and all of these new products, 
products and all of these new artists and amazing new things, I think we are still looking for a curator too. It's not just the experience, it's looking for a point of view. Um, and I think we're all willing to pay for someone to make that more convenient for us, to be able to find things that are truly different and inspiring. I completely agree with that. The, 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 the thing I would add on that is, I'm willing to ins be inspired at your place, but then I'm going home and thinking about it. And then I order it on, in the evening from the couch, if it's available so, uh, from some e-commerce. So um, it, how do we get to the point? And I'm, I'm talking from, from pure pain on, on, on our side here. Uh, we have the same thing. Um, usually people just come to our stores to, to complain. Um, and this is also something that you could, um, that, that you could embrace and say, well, wh why, why aren't we the brand that embraces that and say, yeah, we have people you can yell at, you can, you can show that you're uh, unsatisfied with that. But um, coming back to the retail experience, like how do we pr uh, provide humans with the necessary information and uh, the, the, that they are feeling um, good enough that they make the decision right there and then in your brick and mortar uh, place? I think that's just a little bit aimed at John. I, I agree with Alexander real quick, just touching on the original point. I I'm, I'm in Texas right now, uh, visiting all of the stores that carry all the Walmart stores that carry dirty lemon. So I've been every day going into at least 20 Walmart stores, um, physically touching our product in every single store. So I assure you retail is not dead. Um, these stores are jammed. Most of them has have lines going out the door. Um, that said, I do think we are coming out of a cycle where there, there is there has been too much retail. Um, I, I live in New York City. Uh, I live in Tribeca, and for years we worked in Soho. There was so much retail in Soho, and it was unsustainable. There's an absolutely the only thing that was fueling the retail growth was venture dollars in in concepts that did not justify retail presence uh, of their own. And even the pop-ups that were coming through were, there was far too many of them. And I think it was overload for most consumers. They didn't, you know, it, it was exciting to walk down Broadway or, you know, uh, Mercer or any of these, you know, streets because there was so much, it was like going to an amusement park. Um, but that's not sustainable, not from a financial standpoint or otherwise. Um, and I think COVID has, um, really dramatically changed consumer behavior uh, to a place where they're going to be really pick and choose the, the things that they choose to spend their time with, um, at least for the next few years. So maybe you're going to go out and go shopping on the weekend um, to a place other than Walmart. And, you know, maybe you decide to just go to Showfields, um, or maybe you just decide to go to the Museum of Ice Cream, for example, but you're not going to also go to the Color Factory and to the Museum of Pizza and the museum of whatever, you know, all these things together, it's just way too much, so. Uh, Zach, I'm gonna ping pong off that with the next question, because I actually think that's a really interesting point you bring up and that you're, you're speaking a lot about Texas where you are and the difference between that and like say New York City, right? New York City is, and a few of the other largest cities um, for retail in the world are, are anomalies really for most, for most shoppers. You know, the, the, um, this idea of commerce, entertainment, education, and hospitality being interwoven and that when there's a shift in one over the other, you see a dramatic change in all of the above, right? And, this, and, and so I kind of went on this rant in one of our earlier prep calls where we were talking about, like, if you think about the, the mercantile stores of the you know, Old West, where that was the, literally the only place you could go to get everything, but it was also where you got your news, your mail. Uh, you met your friends and you found out like what was happening in the in the area, uh, not just the the town, but in the area. Um, it's where you found out about politics. It was just the only destination kind of place. Then and then the department stores kind of grew around the cities that were growing as a downtown destination where all of the shopping occurred. So you'd go to the department store and and get everything that you needed. And next to the department stores, the movie theater started to sprout, restaurants started to sprout. So you think about downtown LA and Chicago and New York City and even cities like Omaha, Nebraska and Kansas City, where the, the old theater downtown was next to the, to the um, you know, department store of, of the city. And there were local department stores. And then to, to jump ahead, you know, post-World War II, when J.C. Nickel 
are arguably made the kind of first destination retail district with um, with the the plaza in Kansas City, where he built a retail first area with office and living and even schools. But the retail was kind of the first kind of development component to this district. Things started to change, and we started to see this idea that that those interwoven pieces of theater, hospitality, school, uh, and retail could kind of feed off each other. And that actually worked for quite a while. And it wasn't until the 70s when Jaws and Star Wars and these large big movies came out that the theater shifted and became a more important destination. So you start to see like a, almost like a parametric model that you see like sidewalk labs do. So as the theaters got bigger, the retail component around it changed and shifted. Um, and so eventually we landed at large malls with department stores are now the anchors. The Cineplex is integrated into the mall and the smaller retailers were kind of the, the satellite offerings around those big anchors and the anchor of hospitality. But then we had to Ryan's point earlier, you know, we had the Netflix, come. Uh, strip malls allowed us to, to go just to where we needed to go. We didn't need to go to the big mall. We could get what we needed. Um, and eventually the TikToks and the streaming services came. And so our world around us changed. Uh, but retail kind of, kind of stabilized as this small stores uh, in a district, whether it was at a mall or in New York City or in Chicago or London or what, whatever. And so the, this idea of I think Katie used the word evolution several times. This idea that uh, evolution or change or retail is dead. I guess the question is, is it none of the above? Is, this just the, is it just the fact that all of these other components are changing in our life and that retail is catching up? And so, you know, maybe, maybe John or Irene could even talk about how there's other aspects in our life that are changing maybe faster than retail. And so we're just in a, in a mode now where, Retail is just catching up to technology or to lifestyle. Go, Irene. Okay. Hey, guys. So, you know, I think a lot of the issues that are coming up just in the beginning are really interesting. And I guess, you know, after Mix, a um, little bit of contextualization, it ends up sparking in me really thoughts about, you know, again, the built environment where my specialty is, right? So I end up thinking about what's our relationship, you know, what's the program, what's the kind of function of these buildings? And, you know, a thought that came up was really a tension that, you know, I see between the built environment and, you know, maybe certain, you know, economic demands of retail, which is uh, this question of predictability, uh, this question of repeating things that are successful, of having products that are different, but not necessarily fully out of category. And, you know, we face that a lot. We talked uh, earlier in some of these pregame calls that we had, we talked a lot about education as, um, at least from my perspective, uh, working in a university as one of the um, kind of slowest, most uh, stodgy forms of retail, if you think about it. It's kind of one of the biggest investments that um, our young uh, generation will be making, probably, you know, sometimes almost as large or larger than a mortgage or their first properties. And so making choices about that, making decisions about that is um, stuff that I find really challenging. Um, again, there is that pressure to have diversity and quantity and choice and, and to be able to kind of, you know, constantly fluff up that mountain of options we have. But, you know, it was really funny. I was talking to a friend the other day and we were just talking about how uh, I was like going to do some research on a sponge I was going to buy. I mean, something as dumb as a sponge, you know, or like a cleaning product. And I was like, I'm going to go do some research before I end up buying that product. And, you know, that wasn't something that necessarily you'd be thinking about when you're at the corner store or whether you're in a brick, brick and mortar place where you can kind of touch it and you can see it and you can, you know, you're, you're, the scale of the diversity is something that's human scale that you can handle. So again, kind of tying all these things together, education as a big investment, um, need for diversity of product, but then where does real innovation come in? And then the kind of overwhelm of choices and how I think the changing nature of retail is that 
people are actually bringing a retail mindset to almost all decision-making that they're uh, embarking on. And I see that in architecture, whether someone is thinking about how they're gonna design their house or how they're going to uh, you know, decorate the curtains. It's, there's always a kind of retail economic perspective behind that. Is that a good investment? Is that the best product? And so, I mean, I'd be curious from John's perspective as a you know, behavioral scientist, like how, how, how are consumers dealing with that overwhelm you know that that to me is something that i'm really curious about uh it it's funny you should say that i was just thinking of a that there's this famous study that probably some of you have come across about how to get people to buy jam like jelly at a a, a supermarket have any of you heard this by the way no okay so uh the experiment goes like this free sample day at the supermarket they're People are coming by, there are three options and people taste some of them and then they go and buy. Uh, the next sample day, they I think have like 26 options and people test out tons of them. I mean, like everybody's testing out different flavors and so on and so forth. And what the conclusion was, was wow, look at all the engagement we have around all these products, except when you have that many options, nobody buys. So sales were way down the more options you have. And the most famous scientist to study this is a guy named Barry Schwartz, and it calls it the paradox of choice. And, uh, and he said, he ended up discovering that the more options we have, uh, the less happy we are. And there's a whole slew of reasons. And one of the most important is that when we have very few options and something doesn't work out, we blame reality. But when there's an infinite number of options and that I have something and I've spent time looking for it, then it's my fault. And so you actually end up feeling bad the more options you have, even if the ultimate product is way better than anything you would have had otherwise. So, and you know, uh, yeah, I, and I just want to jump in because that really makes me think about what Katie was saying earlier about having, you know, these curators and we were supposed to have a kind of fun fact earlier and I wanted to interject that one of my fun facts is is like currently in my research you know it means that I'm also reading um, scholarly papers about Kim Kardashian which I think is hysterical but just her effect or or that effect right of these kind of curators of how we make these decisions and mm -hmm. you know I appreciate that anecdote or that uh, experiment that John just uh, shared with us because it really is to me part of like the work I do all the time working with young people uh, you know figuring out how education can evolve but thinking about that particular question right you know students at least the ones I'm working with they're not worried about uh, how many choices but they're exactly worrying what, about what John said which is how do they make the right decision how do they maximize that decision and 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 it comes with this real level of expectation as Katie mentioned before about the product and in our case that's education you know so is it a product that they're buying is it a degree is it um, an experience that they're buying um, or is it access to certain ways of thinking or certain knowledges that they might not have had before so uh, thanks for letting me in a interrupt you, but I, I really, I love that jam example. I'm going to, again, incorporate uh, Katie's curatorial attitude and John's jam anecdote in my next lecture. You guys tune in uh, in the fall. If you want to add one additional fun thing about, uh, or actually two quick things. One is uh, people tend to fall into two different categories when making a decision. Also retail, whatever, no matter, there's maximizers and satisficers. So, and Katie, it seems that you're nodding your head. Maybe you want to field this because you have to deal with it way more than I do. Go for it. So essentially, a maximizer is somebody who spends a ton of time trying to find the absolute best option. Like you go and you read all the blogs and then you compare and you spend hours on it. Is that what's going on on your paper, Irene? Yeah. yeah, I wrote the I wrote the word maximize right up there. So you hit it right there. You got it right now, on the spot. The other group are satisficers. It's where you see a bunch of options, you see ones ranked really high, you pick it and you move on with your day. It turns out that the satisficers are significantly happier with their decision and take significantly less time. So when it comes to happiness or feeling like you've made a good decision, uh, you might be best off just giving your decision to somebody else, like a curator or an expert or the or Katie store, because they have all the cool stuff. So I might as well just go there 
pick out something cool and probably be happy with it. No, it's really funny. I think for us, like we try everything before it comes in the store. And like we have an all natural deodorant company called Each and Every that we're showcasing right now. And we tried 60 all natural deodorants before we curated it. But now when someone's walking through the store and I happen to like be in the booth with them, I can be like, this actually works. I know because I tried 60 and this one's the best one. And and you can ask my team because that was a long 60 days for everyone in our small office. But you know, it's like, I think sometimes like having someone do the legwork makes you so much more satisfied with the choice at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's not about necessarily just hearing about the features, you know, like we're not like, oh, you get a master's degree and then you get a bachelor's degree. It's more actually a lot of our students when they're trying to decide again on one of the biggest investments they're ever going to make in their lifetime is they really want to know about what other students thought. How did you guys come to that experience? Uh, how did you guys come to that decision? What was the thinking process? What did you consider? And they're really hungry for that. So I guess for me, that's like another thing that's really interesting is not only are there choices, there's so many to pick from, and you know, there's the different ways we can engage those choices, but um, it's not, again, just about the features of the product. It's really just the thinking behind it, again, that is uh, really fascinating and really uh, meaningful to especially our young people. Zach, when you're doing, um, uh, you know, a flavor assortment, is there kind of a magic number that you guys find uh, when you put in front of someone like X number of flavors or beverages that they're more likely to convert or, or to buy more? Well, well, funny. Good question, because so last year we like we were always about speed. It was always how quickly can we formulate and launch a new beverage? And then speed led to quantity. So last year we said, we're going to launch a new beverage every 30 days and which no one had ever done before in the beverage space. So we started doing that. And then we very, very quickly realized that it didn't, all we were doing was cannibalizing our sales with, you know, instead of when, you know, as we added SKUs, customers of other SKUs would just say, oh, cool, I'm going to try the new one. And then, you know, it didn't really, you know, do much. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, I see this in the beverage space. There are hundreds and hundreds of beverage brands. And I mean, it, it, there's just, there's only so much room for sales. I mean, as big as beverage is, um, there will never be enough consumers to consume all of the beverages that are launched every single year. And it's not even putting a dent in Coca-Cola's business. So it's like, you look at the, at those metrics and you realize that, you know, there's uh, there's an issue. And I think the same, the same exists in retail. I mean, you look at, you know, all, everything that's happening just yesterday, Bloomingdale's uh, Macy's, you know, uh, uh, or sorry, Macy's, uh, had a huge round of layoffs. You have, uh, Neiman Marcus, you have Nordstrom, you have all of these massive department stores that are having like, you know, massive financial issues. And it's because they're, you know, they are, you know, as the aggregator, um, you know, they weren't curating enough and, you know, the market was really fragmented. Um, but I do think that's going to happen in a lot of other industries where things are just going to go away. The, when you're talking about movie theaters before Mick, I think it was Mick, um, movie theaters should go away. It's a, it's a, it's a waste of real yeah. estate to have a movie theater. Why would you want to go to the movies when you can have a release in your home on your TV, watching it in your pajamas? This is what Netflix has enabled for us. I love going to the movies. I have three children. We go to the movies all the time, but if we can watch it at home, I'm just going to pay 20 or 30 bucks and watch the movie at home on the day that it comes out. So it's like, why have a movie theater? It's, it's just to support. Zach, and, and, I'm not and, sure I agree with you. And, and here's why. why. Uh, do you have Spotify? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But do you, would you ever say, honey, we're just going to stay at home and dance to Spotify? There's fundamentally and, something about being around activity. other yeah. human beings. You're not, you're not around other human beings in a movie theater. You're just there with them. You're not interacting with them. When's the last sure. time you went to the movies and you talked to someone? I, I talk to everybody. Like my wife, uh, just John, my, John talks to everybody. Zach. Like literally. That's a bad... no, Zach, I'm, I'm in full agreement, <laughs> but the experience of 
being around other people, even if you're not in direct communication, uh, is still an experience. Most people didn't interact with everybody at, let's say, Woodstock, but it was still an incredible experience. Just I, because I, I, I could stay at home and post to Instagram that I support Black Lives Matter, but there's some, something fundamentally different about being in a crowd of 100,000 people walking uh, down a street. And so I'm in full agreement that theaters may not be a good use of real estate. No, like, sure. Well, but what is good? Yeah, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, go please. Ahead. I was going to say, what is a good, it, it, the evolution of theaters, for example, is like, you know, now there's these theaters with, you know, uh, beer and wine and food and all this stuff. So like combining two experiences together and then putting that in a movie theater is, is a great, so I, I'm in agreement with you that it, you know, maybe it's an exaggeration to say theaters should all go away. But I do think that, you know, the experience needs to evolve to meet the needs of the modern consumer in a way that, you know, that uh, is relevant to the time. And I think like these massive mega, mega cinemas just don't achieve that. But, but yeah, I, listen, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, in physical human contact and um, yeah, I'm in agreement with you, so. And if you ever want to I watch a, a movie separately at your home and I can watch it mine, we can then join on Zoom and talk about it so that we don't. That's a thing already, distance. John. Netflix party is a thing. Yes. Yeah, Let's yeah. Netflix party, Zach. I think that's a good um, segue into our next question, um, especially because of all the comments that just kind of flooded across with consumer expectations and choice. So it actually reminded me of the, the Robin Williams film, uh, Moscow on the Hudson. If you guys know that one when he's in the supermarket and there's like 50 brands of coffee in the United States and he's used to one brand of coffee coming from obviously <laughs> Soviet times. So, you know, just in terms of the other side of the equation uh, around the cost of customers, um, you know, in store versus online. I know that, you know, in some of our prep calls, Alexander, you had some strong opinions on this, on the cost of, of customer and that there's a significant difference there. Would love for you to maybe elaborate on that. Well, I think it, dem uh, it depends on the customer you're looking for and also the product that you're selling. So uh, uh, customer acquisition cost and CPM and all that, it has become more and more expensive. Um, if you do the total math on certain products, you realize that in some instances, the digital um, e-commerce can be more expensive than the, uh, than the brick and mortar uh, sale. So um, there, there is always um, the, the, um, the, the, let's say, a conundrum in, in there, like, which way do I go? And um, I think most of us would answer, you have to do both in, these world, uh, in this world right now. And you have to find a way to do like the, the entry level with the, with the sparking the interest and all that uh, through the online and then somehow get the people to the offline experience because this is where you make the sale better and um, with more with a more convincing um, arguments than you can ever do uh, uh, through an online channel in my opinion so uh, this is the, the, the like the the curve that you have to build up like in the beginning through digital and then somehow find a way to get them into the store and that's at least what, what we have figured out. Um, I'm not sure whether we are right about it, but uh, we feel pretty confident about it. <laughs> <laughs> Having, uh, I'd actually like to ask Zach on the, basically the same question, or if he agrees with that, just because you guys have a, a humanless interaction, obviously, quote unquote, in store. Um, how do you see it? Yeah, so we, I mean, we have a, just a, just a, Give everyone context we have a retail concept called the drugstore which has been shut down for in new york city since um COVID started and the idea behind the drugstore was let's give people the convenience of uh of being able to purchase any one of our beverages so all of the brands in the portfolio in one place without having to interact with anyone um so they can you can walk into the store you grab a bottle of whatever you'd like and then you just text us which is a, a platform that um that we already had all of the brands using anyway. Um, and then you complete your order at your convenience. I think for a moment in time, that was a very unique idea. I think the, you know, I think that there are flaws in the, yeah, well, I'm getting off track, but anyways, the, I, I do think that the, uh, 
it's a great marketing. It's a, it's a, it was a great marketing initiative. That's not a concept that works at scale. It doesn't it, like there, there's never going to be cashierless stores on every, you know, every, uh, you know, in every town in America, there might be smart vending machines or, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other things that, you know, like technology has moved faster than that analog experience, um, you know, would have allowed for, for scale. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think, uh, that's not going to happen. And you see this already with Amazon go. I mean, it's, um, you know, Amazon's been playing around with this for a while. I don't think that it's something that they're investing more capital in because, um, it, you know, while interesting, it, you know, they, there's a lot of challenges with, uh, with retail in that format. The other thing is that you cannot do it with every product. For instance, our product needs some explanation at the end of the day. The, uh, our plants, uh, even though I think ours are uh, on the uh, easier end uh, compared to our competitors to understand, but still you need some explanation. And I would assume the same goes uh, for Katie's uh, experience. At least there, there needs to be somebody who, who has to tell the customer, oh, I tried this, this really works. And this is, I think, the, the, the tipping point where the customer is more convinced that this is a great product um so i, I don't believe in completely uh humanless uh, i want to is technology though i mean like we just launched something called the magic wand in response to covid where you can experience the entire store go through ask questions um learn about every single product without ever interacting with a human it's a audio tour that's paired with an app uh, where you can ask questions, you can purchase, you can learn things, you can learn about products, and you're actually hearing the stories of each of the brands and the art from the artists and the founders. So I do think that there are, are ways that, um, you know, technology will evolve towards more contactless experiences for those who opt into them. We still have the live tour that is more popular. People still want to be with another person, even in times of COVID and walk through the store, but there's definitely uh, advancements in the technology side towards completely, uh, you know, self-guided experiences. Um, it's funny because uh, I want to shift gears. We're we originally had set up this, this with two teams, group A and group B, because we, we had this idea of almost like debate style, forcing you guys to pick a side because it's a complex discussion, right? Uh, retail, experiential, community. And we, we kind of wanted to just force you guys to, to, to answer or give a solution based on the team or position that you're given. So that's why you see the A and B behind everyone. Uh, Katie was going to make an A out of kayak um, oars or something yeah, behind her. Um, because of time, because this discussion has been so good, we, we, we've, we've lost a little bit of the time, but I still want to do this. Um, what I, I find is really interesting is that um, all the way back in the conversation with Alexander talked about um, giving you somebody to yell at and John talking about the kind of social aspect of going to restaurants or or uh, not dancing to Spotify. Um, and, and then Katie talking about retail experiential. I think there's a really interesting uh, phenomenon that's happening around uh, retail as in commerce retail. And, and, and I do think there are relationships to education and hospitality and everything. But uh, if you look at like what Nike's just recently announced, so Nike just announced that they're going to build 200 of their um, neighborhood stores. And I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but Nike by Melrose was the first Nike neighborhood store. It was created in Los Angeles several years ago now, maybe four years ago. Um, it's a small destination store uh, within a neighborhood. There's no signage out front. Um, the stock inside is rotated every two weeks based on the needs of the neighborhood, based on data that they collect by scraping what people in the neighborhood are looking at online. They actually have partnerships with some of their um, brand partners, the foot lockers and stuff to get data from their partners as well. Um, and then they get the, the true response from their customers, which are local customers. So they have, for example, they've created a vending machine and in the vending machine, instead of Nike product, they have like vouchers for Pilates and yoga by local instructors. 
And what they do is you can use your uh, Nike Plus account once a month to get a free thing out of the vending machine. Um, and and it, it encourages kind of local businesses to offer something in the machine. And it encourages people to come in at least every 30 days to see what they can get. Um, and, and it's been a huge success for them. The other thing that they do, which is really interesting, is they don't return the returned product back to the mothership. They keep it um, in store under a mannequin and that they sell it at half price. So, so someone, Zach returns a pair of shoes that's size 12 and he should have gotten the 11s. Alexander can go in there and buy Zach's 12s at half price that he returned. So they've decided now post or during COVID uh, that that's the model that they want to pursue, pursue with. And I think there's a really interesting position there. So group B, if you, um, if you are going to expand Zach's business and we told you that you had to do the Nike model of the Nike neighborhood store, um, what markets would you think that you would need to uh, pursue? Why and how does that relate to this discussion about community? It's Zach and Irene. All right, so Irene, do you want to go first? I, I, I just want to make sure I have the, the, the question correct. So we're expanding a business. Yep. The, uh, the plan is to have a, a, you know, a, a, a smarter, more neighborhood focused store launched in how many cities? The 200 cities. 200 cities, okay. No, no, no. So just, so no. Just... There are 200 cities? <laughs> They're going to do 200 <laughs> stores. That's a really good point. 200 stores. Let's say 200 stores. Okay. No, no, but sorry. <laughs> You're the, in New York. What's the question though? Three, you said That's three the marks. Question, the, the, the position is explain how you decide where to open these markets and what are the first markets that you go after uh, to establish these local stores for your brand. Got it. Irene, specifically you for your brand. All right, I'm totally, I'm gonna take a stab out there. So just remember, I'm an academic, all right, guys, I, even though I'm group B. Um, I think for me then I, you know, my answer would be, I would, I don't know if I would be tied to physical community. Like I think physical community is important, but I've noticed, you know, a lot of, um, again, our next generation of students, especially the young people I'm working with all the time, they deal with community in such, you know, fluid ways. It's like AR, VR, they're constantly not tied to physical presence to, to have a fulfilling, you know, community exchange and, it, and it's all over the place, right? And, and I think in that sense to me, what I would target first is not necessarily um, a physical place, again, a locale, but rather a, a topic or a kind of interest or some kind of intellectual thing that can bind a larger group of folks together, right? And, and, and have a discussion with that, you know, kind of spark it through, um, you know, values or curiosities about a particular product within within a particular community. And I think then, um, you know, that builds, for me at least, again, thinking about education, students making uh, the biggest investment of their life. Uh, you know, we have a global cohort that comes to study at the University of Michigan. And, you know, they're really interested in understanding um, the, the experience or the product in advance of that. Um, and then they bring it back to their local communities and they talk about it. But again, local or immediate community can be across an entire country and they have, you know, a chat group or they have, um, you know, another way of, of becoming a cohort that I think is really, is really changing. So I think for me, that's, that's how I would um, take a stab at it. That's how I would approach it. All right, so here's what I would do. As an early stage brand, like your own retail store is not a good spend of capital. I would take all of those locations, turn them into distribution hubs, buy a bunch of bicycles and have delivery drivers that meet at that hub to pick up the product and then deliver it directly to consumers' homes. Um, because having your own, like it works for Nike because it's Nike. It's one of the best brands in the world. 
would it work for another, you know, uh, early stage brand? No, because, you know, you, you don't have the power of, you know, recognition and, um, you know, the internet's a better tool to get your word out. And then if you can over exceed expectations by delivering products to consumers in the places where they live or work very fast, then that's, um, that's an expectation that you can't control and you can over deliver in that to actually have, um, you know, create a lasting memory that people want to come back to. Well, and that gets over the fidelity problem, right? Like, you know, again, what we're dealing with now is we're thinking about how we change in residence education to an online um, experience, right? And um, a lot of our our students are thinking about, well, what does that mean for me? Is, is that a lesser product? And again, there's this uh, bandwidth issue or this idea of, of fidelity that doesn't that we have in the physical environment. Um, you know, you 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 get to experience the thing or or the product with all your senses. Whereas when you're um, doing it through a digital format, you're you're relying, you have to make up for that ability to kind of grope the product uh, physically that you can't do in a virtual sense. And so, you know, I think Zach's idea of, of kind of, you know, getting it out and delivering it uh, to these, you know, different individuals is a real way to kind of build up that tactile, uh, you know, relationship with the product too. I know, I know uh, Ryan's going to jump in here with the team a question really quick, but I do want to, I, I love the idea uh, that Zach's putting forth. And I think it's a really interesting idea. It maybe when, when the next team is answering, they can pepper in a little bit of this. I don't want it to hog too much time, but there is an interesting model about retail as distribution. Right, retail is a distribution center. Uh, to Alexander's point earlier, it's a service point for people screaming at, at you too. I mean, there, there's an interesting model that it's more than just um, uh, it's more than just shopping. It's you know, it's this point of contact where things can happen. And I think there's a great um, kind of commentary happening in the chat box about clientship CX. And I think um, we're we're not going to get to it now, but when we get to Team A, maybe Katie can pepper in there. Well, that you know, Showfields is definitely about this. It's definitely about this kind of consumer experience, and that consumer experience, service, and kind of community is is are things where retail can still play an important part. But I think to Zach's point, this distribution model is really interesting as well, and I think that's worth worth debating another time. Well, and Ryan, I just wanted to add the yeah. last thing is that if you think about retail, like to me, it just strikes me as an incredibly social activity, right? Like if you're, you know, you go shopping with your friends or whether that's online or virtually, you know, it's a social thing, like figuring out, like, does that make sense to someone else? Does that product ring true to someone else? Is that something I also want? But it's, it's so social. And I think for me, again, as an architect, uh, as someone trained as an architect, thinking about what the space of that is, whether it's AR, VR, bricks and mortar, all that stuff is, is again, really interesting. So um, how do you overcome that when we're hybridized, when we're hybridized? And it's also about education. Um, people come to the stores and ask questions for uh, regarding products. I guess Katie will uh, will vouch for that. Uh, for us at uh, T-Mobile, people will come and they 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 will ask us, "What do you think I need?" And then you need to educate them about their behavior and what fits their uh, their behavior. So um, I completely agree with uh, with what you just said there. Yeah, and I think on that point of distribution, that's a really great point, Zach. Just because. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why Nordstrom Local or some of these larger brick and mortars are kind of going smaller and finding a way to really kind of find those proof points of how they're going to be able to distribute and be able to do that in, in, a, in a smarter way than obviously having big box kind of everywhere across the, the board. Um, so team A, uh, this is going to be, I think, a really challenging one for you, uh, but we're really excited about it. So um, team A. Uh, you have to take this position. You believe that physical retail is dead. What is your marketing plan for driving everyone to your D to C offering? Go. Uh, I introduced COVID nineteen into the market. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, done. <laughs> Shoot. Well, if Zach is right that there's just too much of stuff. 
then what we need to promote is more people having babies so that we could have more customers. So I'm uh, pro having everybody should have as many children as possible so that we could have a growing customer base. Um, I, I think it's then about, uh, it's about creating mass and community around your product um, within a digital sense. So, you know, for us, we just launched live video shopping feeds and, and it's like QVC for millennials. And we have different hosts, uh, who have their own following their own sort of opinion on things. And people are tuning in to watch them, uh, not because of us, they're tuning in because they care about what this art curator is curating and what they're talking about and, and why they're showing, you know, African-American artists that week and the stories behind each of them. I think if you, if retail is dead and digital is how you have to go with the rising cost of acquisition, you have to figure out what your community is around you and then spend against that in order to reach scale. Um, there's no way in the current environment that you can spend effectively enough just in paid digital to have enough customers to scale. Especially as the noise becomes more and more in the digital world, it, it's really hard to stick out. But um, and trying to answer your question, one of the easiest things that would spring to my mind is offer the um, the product that you have through the digital channel with some benefits that you won't get in the retail channel. So I will uh, let's say an extended warranty because you help me save some money on shelf space on a very expensive um, brick and mortar um, yeah. place. Um, that, that, that could be something that I, I could introduce. Um, and the other thing um, I think that will really help, no, not help, but um, will get people to use the, um, in, in the digital way more is provide them with more convenience than there. I, I'm not sure how to do that, but this is what I would try to do uh, to, to give them what Katie just said with, uh, with the curators, um, channels that will give you more and a broader view on a product that I, as a uh, as a sales representative, couldn't do in a, in a in a in the um, in the shop itself. So you can have video there, you can have analysis there, you have comparisons there, stuff that one single person cannot make up for. So those are the two things that I I could just uh, come up with in thirty seconds. I'd like to offer a quick uh, counter to what John was saying about having more children. Um, <laughs> I think we need to just. I don't uh, have any. I was totally kidding. No, no, I'm no, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm just saying that I, I think we need less products. There are way too many products on the market. Like there, I use Katie's example of the deodorant all the time because I remember Katie saying that earlier in the year uh, about the sixty deodorants. We don't need sixty deodorants. We don't need that. So why not? Like we need to cut back on the number of products, and we need to stop enabling. Pro, like so many products to, to go to market because it's not doing anything. It actually so go communism. <laughs> well, <laughs> just I mean, one product. <laughs> I mean, it's a deeper conversation, but it's not, it's not about no competition. It's just that, uh, you know, the like consumers have decision fatigue when it comes to choosing so many different things. And there's so many dollars spent and just trying to get to a place where you have enough momentum to, uh, you know, to take your business to the next level. And for a lot of products, it'll never, they'll never get there because they're not. One thing I've, I've observed in being in all these Walmarts, I've been in uh, almost 200 Walmarts. Now the products that succeed and make it to Walmart shelves are differentiated and they, they appeal to the majority of Americans. So there's a, and I think that a lot of the noise comes from um, products that are so curated in niche that, you know, they'll never reach that scale. And I think that, that, you know, that's the, um, there has to be mass appeal to a product in order for it to really, unless it, it unless it's just a hobby business for someone, it, you know, in order for it to really kind of justify the investment that comes with building a brand. Um, yeah. Anyways, that's a, it's probably another, it's, no, I think, I think John, question. Zach, I think you're dead on. I think John probably can, give a more thoughtful, serious so, answer about behavior and its relationship to that. This idea of too many products, I think is a really interesting aspect. What, one of my favorite examples of this is Hamburger Helper. So the traditional model is keep releasing SKUs so that you get more shelf space and that functions as an advertisement. Zach, you were talking about how terrible an idea uh, that is. 
because what essentially happened was parents stopped buying Hamburger Helper uh, because there were so many flavors, they couldn't trust that their children would want it. And children being such finicky eaters, as I've heard, because uh, that it's uh, that yes. they, yeah. So uh, being such finicky eaters, since they couldn't trust that the skew would be available, they would go with somewhere else. So initially, you see this like bump when you release a new product because they're the early adopters and people want to try it, and you get like uh, more shelf space, and then you have this issue, like a simple example competitors is Spindrift. Spindrift released uh, a whole bunch of initial products that were really fun and tasty. And then as their SKUs increased, it became impossible to find the ones that I actually wanted. And so it became less appealing to purchase. All right, guys, um, we're going to get kicked out of this room and I don't want to get kicked out until we have a chance to thank everyone. Um, I actually could keep going. I think that everyone on here knows that we've we've done this on our prep call. I think it went an hour longer than scheduled. Um, this idea of of evolution of retail and uh, community and community building and still this social contact, I think, is really relevant and it's interesting, especially given the current um, state of things. Um, I, I just wanted to say really quick, thank you to all of you. It's a it's been a really great discussion. Um, I wish we could talk more and um, maybe we could do a round two another time on another panel, Pierce. Uh, thanks again, everyone, yeah. for doing well, this. Well, that's thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I think um, if we you enjoyed that, one of the things that we have been doing is setting up um, a call, same time, same place, a week later, more of a kind of classic Zoom call um, to let attendees uh, have more of a kind of dialogue with the, with the speakers. So, um, Let's talk about that after the fact and we can invite everybody back and see if they want to continue the conversation. But that was so rich and helpful and uh, I love the debate. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Pierce.